Uh, hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Neil Silcox. I'm the Faculty Excellence Developer here at the Maple League of Universities. I'm joining you from uh, uh, in Mi'kma'ki, uh, which is colonially called Halifax, Nova Scotia. It is a terrific day here. It's daring me to open the window, but I think it's still a little cold. Um, we have people come coming to us from all across Turtle Island and around the world. So if you'd like to drop into the chat where you are joining from, we'd love to hear uh, from you. I'm really excited to welcome you to Learning from Failure, Moving from Rhetoric to Meaningful Impact. Um, our guest today has a PhD in Pathology and Molecular Medicine and is a professor of a professor teaching stream in the Department of Biology at the Institute for the Study of University uh, Pedagogy and at the University of Toronto Mississauga. I didn't say that quite right, I'm sorry. Her research focuses on learning from failure, the science of learning, and public communication of science. She is a 2023 3M National Teaching Fellow and is also a member of the University of Toronto's TIDE Group, Toronto Initiative for Diversity and Education and Excellence through which she gives lectures and workshops on an unconscious on unconscious bias, equity, and diversity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fiona Roll. Take it away. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I can see so many names in the room that I recognize, and it's really lovely to see everyone. So this session today, um, is very interactive. I would like you to have your chat box open so that we can share some responses back and forth. You can respond to everyone in the group so that your chat is public or in the blue box, you can select my name and just send your chat comment uh, anonymously to myself and I will uh, share your comments anonymously. So this, what we're going to talk about today, learning through failure, there are so many pieces of the failure pie that we could talk about. Um, what we're going to focus on is an initiative that started at the University of Toronto, Mississauga called FLIP. And FLIP stands for Failure Learning in Progress. And I think the most important word here is the P, the progress. We focus so much on the product or the outcome, and we want to reframe to focus on the progress, the process. When we think of the word failure, there's a lot of different words that come to mind, and we're going to take a look at some of them. But one thing I want to mention first is how it's absolutely normal when we see this word failure to have a negative reaction. We can see this with blood measurements of cortisol and other things. We immediately think of risk and we think of fear. But on the other side of that, we can also look at motivation and curiosity. It's been said for a long time that adults are less curious than toddlers. Like to you see toddlers toddling around, exploring, sometimes getting injured, falling down, exploring everything. And when people say that adults are less curious than toddlers, it's actually not correct. Studies have shown that the curiosity indices are very similar, but adults are much more risk adverse. There's much more fear of failure and risk adverse and more awareness of risk. We know that if students have different types of motivation that affects their openness, their ability to learn, it can affect which structural supports they need for learning. We know if students have a genuine curiosity that affects retention and recall from learning. And something that is really important to students that we discuss when we talk about this is this link between procrastination and perfectionism and perfection paralysis, sometimes called analysis paralysis that we're gonna talk about as well. Sometimes procrastination is framed as a negative thing relating to time management. And it's not about time management. It's often about mood management. It's about protecting ourselves. Procrastination is a protective mechanism. We don't wanna be uncomfortable. So we're gonna talk a lot about finding comfort in discomfort and how different people have different supports 
to be able to do that. We have to be really careful of some of this rhetoric and making sure we're looking at it with an equity lens. And another word that is one of my favorite words is context. And I wanna give credit to Erin Wittick, who's on the call um, from the United States right now, because we have lots of conversations about context matters. If we are looking at a study on learning, it's really important we look at where this was done, which students were involved, which discipline. The context really matters, especially when we're asking students to take risks, when we're asking students to be vulnerable. Vulnerability and context is really important to consider. So if you think of stories in the press of learning from failure, there's so many related to innovation. Some of them are true failures and some of them are accidental discoveries because someone was taking a risk, trying something new. Does anyone know what this is, what this picture is? I invite you to share in the chat. Do you recognize this picture? Yeah, absolutely. So this is known as blue, Little Blue Pill or Viagra. It's produced by Pfizer. Extremely profitable and successful. Um, but when it was developed, it was not actually developed for what it's being sold for today. It was developed as a heart medication, but during the clinical trials, they noticed that the people enrolled in the trials had a different outcome. And so they were able to market this with a different outcome. Hugely successful, not its intended purpose. Is that a failure or is it an accidental discovery? What about this? Does anyone know what this is? I invite you to share in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. This is a pacemaker. And this was also an accidental discovery. The electrical engineer that was, was putting this together used the wrong type of uh, transistor and resulted in the pacemaker, which was an absolutely huge leap forward in cardio medicine. And these stories are full of popular culture, silly putty, post-it notes, certain types of anesthesia, the slinky, these were all accidental discoveries. And another thing when you look at pop culture is that advice about failure and quotes about failure are found everywhere. So Oprah Winfrey talks really openly about how she was fired from her first job in broadcasting. Thomas Edison, his quote is often misquoted. When you look at the history of what he said about failure, it's, it's repeated in about 40 different ways, but one version of the quote is, I have not failed 10,000 times. I've successfully found 10,000 ways that will not work. Steve Jobs talked openly about he was how he was fired from Apple computers. He was brought back into the fold when they bought another company that he was a part of. Michael Jordan talks all the time about the number of shots he missed, the number of times he was trusted to take the last shot of the game and missed that shot. So narratives of failure are all around us. There are some caveats we have to consider when we look at these stories. And one example of that, I'm gonna walk you through this graph. So this was a paper that came out in 2019. And what you're looking at is the economist uh, illustration of some of this data. So National Institutes of Health, NIH in the United States, they were looking at those that got grant funding and they wanted to look at the applicants that were just at the cutoff, the near miss and the near win applicants. So just at that cutoff. What happens if you follow these applicants out over time? If you look five years, 10 years out, how many papers do they get? How many citations do they get? And what they found in this study was that the applicants that were just at that near miss point, they missed that funding from the NIH, they were actually better off on these metrics five and 10 years out than the near win applicants. And this looks like a story of failure success. But what we have to remember is that there is a huge degree of survivorship bias. We're looking at the folks 
that are still in that field, the folks that are, quote, still playing that game. So we really have to keep in mind, what are the absences to some of these stories? Because that can add to the rhetoric of resilience. So I don't know if any of you were children or growing up in the 70s or 80s like I was, but there was a really popular phrase that you would see in parenting books in the 70s and 80s, and that was practice makes perfect. And this phrase was repeated uh, really frequently, and I remember this. And what we're really driving for in some of the educational tools we're developing is to try to get rid of this idea of perfect and really focus on progress. Practice makes progress. So how can we not think of failure as finite? Instead, think of it as part of progress, part of the process and not one defining event. I was watching, uh, there's a new D&D movie in the theaters, Dungeons and Dragons, and my kids are huge Dungeons and Dragons fans. And we were in the theater and there's this quote about failure in the movie. And one of the individuals says, yeah, you fail and you fail and you fail and you keep failing. And if you stop failing, then you failed. And it was interesting, the past tense, adding the ED onto fail. And I've been thinking about that since I saw it. So something else about process. I just actually back up a second. We have to look at the process of failure because that's how we learn. And it's especially important when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion with respect to innovation. I'd like to lead us through an exercise. This comes from um, the TIDE group that I work with at the University of Toronto. So I'm assuming everyone on the call has a mobile phone. <laughs> when YouTube developed their direct upload app, it went through incredible development phase testing and beta testing. So Google owns YouTube. They're famous for their rigorous testing. They have a direct upload app where you hold the phone, you take a video, you press one button, it directly uploads. They didn't have any problems in their development phase or beta test. But when this launched worldwide, it failed five to 10% of the time. Five to 10% of the time, the image was upside down. Can you jump in the chat? What do you think was happening? Why wasn't it working? It didn't work as it was supposed to. It was failing. What was happening? When I did this exercise with some high schoolers, we were talking about diversity on teams and a bunch of them said, oh, everyone in Australia, it didn't work. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with geographic location. It doesn't have to do with operating system. Uh, yeah, the screen lock wasn't on. It didn't have to do with that. Some of you in the chat are absolutely right. It had to do with handedness. If you are left-handed versus right-handed, you hold your phone in a different orientation. They didn't have any left-handers on their development team or their beta test team. And this is uh, the failure here. The process that led to this failure shows the importance of diversity on teams. And in, in this case, it's diversity of, of left-handedness versus right-handedness. So we need to pay attention to the stories. It's not just the product or the outcome, it's the process and how we get there. And so I wanna highlight how important the people are to that process. So there's a huge team behind what I'm gonna be speaking about. Uh, Dr. Crystal Nunes, who's on the call, was a postdoctoral fellow on this group. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of, of her data that was published last year. And she's currently a professor at Toronto Metropolitan University. Maria Dacios is the current postdoctoral fellow on this product project. And I'm also gonna show some data from Esther and Pooja, who were two students as partners on the work today. So flip. Failure, learning, and progress. We think of it as failure pie. And there's several different projects that we're looking at. You will have access to all of these slides. So don't worry if you can't read what's on it just now. So the first thing we wanted to look at was failure 
as a core part of the learning process. We know that our brains remember things differently when we fail. And failing and trying and experimenting should be a normal part of how we learn. But are we actually teaching students how to embrace and learn from failure? What supports do students need? And then what does it look like in different disciplines? In science, failure is core to the process of science, the scientific method. We want to get negative results. That teaches us something, but it's pretty hard to publish that. And when we look at our textbooks, our textbooks are narratives of failures, of science's success. They're not narratives of time scientists failed usually. What does it look like in history? Mary Cowan is one of our collaborators in history and she talks about going to archives and failing to find what you're looking for in the archives. What does it look like in geography? Nicole Le Liberté is co-lead on this project and she talks about how failing in geography looks really differently from failing in science. Dan Guadagnolo, who's in information technology and marketing, talks about how we talk about failure. What does it look like in engineering? Structural failure, why did this bridge collapse? In business, fail fast, fail often is said all the time. But is that equitably, equitably distributed? We know from banking data in the United States, folks who are visible minorities have a harder time getting a second loan if their first business fails. So that fail fast, fail often might not apply to everyone. We're also interested in the high school to higher ed transition. This is a time of intense perceptions of failure, often relating to expectations. How do we support students? We are very concerned about student well-being. Does embracing and learning from failure have a role to play? The perceptions of this, the stigmas of this, does it have a role to play in wellness? And then this golden circle in the middle that touches every part of this failure pie really comes down to power and privilege. We can't be having these conversations if we don't talk about the power and privilege of failure. It's so much easier to take risks when you have a safety net. And not all students have a safety net. The same goes for faculty. We know from student evaluations of teaching that there is inherent bias in how instructors are judged. And we have some early data that shows if a person from the non-dominant group in a discipline is openly talking about failures and mistakes they've made, they are judged more critically than someone who's from the dominant group. And so can we be asking instructors to share narratives of failure when it might impact their evaluations of teaching? We have to think about all the ramifications of that. Okay, so I'd like to get into some activities that we do with our class and I'm going to show you some data. So if everyone could come over to the chat and in this case do not hit enter. We're going to hit enter all at the same time. So I invite you to share either publicly or just to me. What's the first word that comes to mind when you hear the word failure? And we will hit enter all at the same time. So what is the first word that comes to mind? And go ahead and hit enter now. And some of the words I see is apprehension, shame, loss, learning, why, why me, wrong, rejection, struggle, embarrassment, end of world, what's next, isolation, quality, knowledge, part of the process, excellence. So there's a whole range of words that come to mind. Some have a more positive bent and some might have a more negative bent. Some are related to an outcome or finite. Some are related to process. And what we did with our students is we'll ask our intro students coming into first year this same question. What words comes to mind? And the data I'm gonna show you here is from science students entering first year biology. These are their most common words. First is disappointment, struggle, hopeless, embarrassed. So the first four words of this word association 
had this negative bend. Some of them became personal. I suck, you suck, try again. Oops. And then there were some other positive words coming after that, but those were the top six in this, in this subset of students. And when we look across all the words that come up, the majority were negative. Some were neutral and then some were positive. And we were asking ourselves, when we go through and do these interventions with students, trying to normalize learning from failure with structural support, would their word associations change? And so what we find is, is they do change through term. So there becomes this more positive bent. And we could also look at the finite versus the process oriented terms, and they do become more positive. These are some of their positive responses. There's more words relating to learning and process. Disappointment is still up there. There's more words relating to opportunity, second chances, and embarrassed is still up there. Try again, moved up a little bit. It's okay. And then there were some words that came out that weren't there the first time around, like importance and preparation. This is some data from Christina McCarr, who is a fourth year student as partner on this project. And she was looking at definitions. We will ask students to give us a definition of failure. And then that definition is coded according to Cresswell. And we analyze the themes. And she was looking at where is process and growth in that definition. And process and growth was fairly common. But what we saw is it moved up the scale in the post data. So when students are exposed to some of these learning through failure activities, their definitions of failure start to adopt more language relating to, to processing growth. And this is just some of her raw data that I thought I would show you. Another metric we are interested in is time to engagement. So I definitely did this in my undergrad. I don't know if those of you have taken first, second year calculus and functions, but the instructor would put a question on the board and ask you to do it. And I remember writing down the question and thinking, oh, I'll do that later in my room. I didn't want it to do it right then. And we were noticing, especially in genetics, our students would do this. They'd write down the question, but then they wouldn't start to answer it. And we can tell on classroom response systems when students open it and start to answer a question. Could we shorten this time to engagement? Could we get students to start thinking about it right away? And what we're trying to look at here is this procrastination related to, to being uncomfortable or related to not knowing the right answer, the right approach. Yes, we need to pause and reflect and learning should be slow, but for these exercises where we're dealing with troublesome knowledge, could we shorten that time to engagement? I'm gonna give you some examples of some of these questions. So these are not genetics or math questions, but they can be troublesome knowledge. And what I'd like you to do is answer this in the chat, but again, we'll all hit enter at the same time. So if someone loses weight, where does that mass go? Where do those grams, those kilograms go? Are they lost as energy, sweat, into muscle, breath, or something else? So I invite you, enter in the chat, and we will all hit enter in the same time. Do it as quick as you can. First thing that comes to mind. Don't think too hard about it. We're going to hit enter in three, two, one. Hit enter. So you can see there's a huge range here. And when we ask this question of students in class, they say energy. They see A. They say A. And then I'll say, no, that's not the right answer. Let's think, pair, share, go into your groups, answer again. And then they'll say sweat. Then I'll say, no, it's not A or B. Then they'll say E. And eventually we come down to D. The answer is breath. You lose that mass in carbon when you exhale through carbon dioxide. And yes, some is lost as urea and other things, but about 80%, 75 to 80% of the mass that you lose is lost through carbon. So it's breath. And students know this. 
because they've memorized the equations of metabolism since grade 10 science, but they can't apply it. And a lot of these questions are related to application. I'll give you another question that is also troublesome knowledge that we're trying to get students to answer as quick as you can. And then we dive into why they answered a certain way. So where does the mass of this tree come from? You start with an acorn, you get an oak tree. Where does the mass come from? Does it come from water, air, soil, minerals from the ground, something else? Go ahead and enter your answer and hit enter right away. A lot of you have caught on that air might be involved in this instance, maybe parallel to the earlier one. And absolutely, the answer is air. And students have memorized the equation of photosynthesis, again, since grade 10 or 11 usually, um, but it's difficult to apply it to this context. And so when we ask students this question, usually they answer water, then soil, then minerals, then something else, and then air. The majority of students, these are intro students. And it's about troublesome knowledge where there are gaps in application. We find these types of questions really helpful for working on that time to engagement. Another thing we do, and I will not ask you to draw chromosomes, but we ask students to do a lot of different drawings, phylogenetic trees, chromosomes. We ask students to label on cells where a mutated protein would be, for example. And through drawing and following a drawing out in the process, we can find where mistakes are being made. We do a lot of drawing to try to normalize making mistakes. So we ask the students, okay, what would chromosomes look like in a non-dividing cell? This is a really common misconception here. Chromosomes don't look like Xs. Usually we think they do because of how we take pictures at a certain part of the cell cycle. And the right answer here is, is to the right. It would actually look like a smear because it's non-condensed. But we ask students to draw this out. So for example, draw chromosomes right before something happens and right after something happens. In this case, I'm just asking about replication. These are some examples of student drawings, all of which have something wrong with it, but they have different things. And what's wrong or mistaken about the answer illustrates where there are blocks to threshold concepts, to these core concepts of the discipline. And through some of this work we're doing, we're, we're realizing how important drawing is. And drawing takes time. Drawing needs structural support to answer it, to review the answers in terms of TA hours, et cetera. But through a lot of peer share work, we're able to do this in large classes. So now let's jump to specific failures and talking about failure, because we can speak a lot about how it's so good to learn from failure. But what if we're asked to give a specific example that's personal, that maybe says something about us? So what I'd like you to do in the chat, if you feel comfortable, please share an example of a past failure. And you can send one to me privately, and I'll share it anonymously if you'd like. So just take a minute. And we'll all hit enter it at the same time again. What's an example of a past failure? So some of the ones folks are sharing is that my plants died because I forgot to water them. Driving through a garage door with a family car at 15, not getting into a writing program, Expectations are not met. Grant application rejections, paper rejections. Not getting a SHRC grant, a social science grant. Being a writer, getting rejections fairly frequently. Failing to, divine, to define strong evaluation metrics on assignments. Implementing something in class, implementing student peer evaluations. So there's lots of different examples that are coming up. And something our students will say to us when we talk about this is, isn't, aren't some failures actually bad? Like, should we really be celebrating all types of failures? 
And we started thinking, are some failures different? Do we learn different things? Some students will say, well, any failure is bad if you don't learn from it. We start to see those quotes coming up. And we started to work on this failure continuum. It's actually more of a web model, but for today's talk, we're just looking at this continuum. And this comes from business. We changed some of the language with it. Um, I'm just gonna show you sort of this continuum. How would you classify your failure? Would it be poor behavior? Was it inattention? Inexperience? Was there something wrong with the process? Was the task just really hard? Was the process just really complex? Was there uncertainty about everything? Were you hypothesis testing? Was it, were you experimenting? What I'm going to do is I'm going to annotate this. I'm gonna hide names of the annotators so your annotation is anonymous. If you click on annotate, the down arrow where it shares, I'm sh says I'm sharing my screen, you can annotate and collect a stamp. And so I indicated in the chat that I had done really poorly on an undergraduate chem midterm. And this was, I think, partly because of inexperience. I didn't want to open my textbook. I wanted to sell it back to the bookstore at the end of term. So I did not put in the time I should have done to studying. So I invite you, the failure you just shared, I invite you to indicate on the screen where it would fit. And please feel free to send me a direct message and I will indicate for you uh, if you're having any trouble with the annotation tool. So I'm gonna add a couple here. Someone said, can you go further left on the scale off the screen? <laughs> I'll just, I'll put that right at, right at the edge there. Okay, so when we share this in class, most students will indicate that their failure is on the left-hand side. They're thinking of failures related to inexperience, inattention, didn't do well on a quiz, had my phone out in class, things like that. And we ask them to think of failures at other spots on the continuum. Can you think of a failure at every single spot? on this continuum. Can you shift your failures to the right, the ones that you're thinking of? And students had a lot of difficulty with this at the start because this isn't how they were thinking of failure. They were thinking of failure, something I had done wrong and was finite, related to often inexperience or inattention. This is some of uh, Dr. Nunez's data, who's on the call right now. She published this paper looking at science student perspectives on how we can decrease the stigma of failure. What role was the stigma playing? What can instructors do to decrease stigma? What could the institution do? And one thing we asked the students is, do you have a fear of failure and what contributes to your fear? And you can see here the importance of all of these things, but especially societal pressure and family. If it's societal pressure and family, what can the instructor do? What can the institution do to try to shift that stigma? And the students again and again kept coming back to the importance of fostering a community of failure. It can't just be the students that are failing and sharing their narratives. We need to foster a community of failure. And we asked for examples from students. We asked for things that resonated with students. What's a meaningful way to do this? And I wanted to share some with you. Uh, Megan Ward, who's a master's student at Trent University now, was doing some work looking at the field work fail hashtag. So this was really popular on Twitter about five years ago. And when we shared these with the students, they just loved them. Field work is is full of inherent failures. Some are bad luck. Some you learn from, some you don't. Some are because of your subject is a live organism. Um, some are related to other people. And what Megan did is she went through all of these uh, Twitter posts and she categorized the failures. What type were there that people were sharing? And I thought I'd share a couple with you. 
So this Friday, Frilly was also a bit of a fieldwork fail. When frillneck lizards are released, they immediately run up the nearest tallest object for safety. It's usually a tree. In this case, it was me. So many posts were related to cameras going missing. Wanted for robbery, robber cra crab, prime suspect of skillful dislodging and subsequently stealing of a thermal camera. This person posted, just admiring my excellent camera placement. And an artist did a series of these. Um, and I'm gonna show you two here. Accidentally glued myself to a crocodile while attaching a radio transmitter. Some failures were quite dangerous. Some a bit less so maybe. When you spill pheromone solution on yourself and become the sexiest darn tanner beetle in all of Skane. And we found that different disciplines have different narratives of failure. And some narratives people share and some narratives people don't share. But this was one of the most important things that came out of Crystal's research about what instructors can do to decrease the stigma of failure. And the number one thing is discussion, talking about this openly and fostering a community of failure. And looking at it in different roles, different jobs. I really like this quote from Bobak Ferdowsi. He's an engineer with NASA. And he says, the way Astro Shell, that's Shell Lindgren, uh, uh, astronaut, the way Astro Shell phrases it is that locally in the moment, failure is not an option, a la Apollo 13. But we all acknowledge failure is a huge part of what we do, especially if you're like me. And that's literally your job. His job is to is to break things and figure out why things break. So those are some of the things we're doing with students in class. But it's really important as we talk about this, we talk about structural supports and EBI implications. As I mentioned, instructors need support in doing this work. We need to look at the data on teaching evaluations. How does that impact them? That's a very real aspect of precarious work. But also with our students, discussions around failure and stigma need to be trauma aware. And we have to be careful of the words grit and resilience. So there's a huge rhetoric around resilience and rhetoric around grit. One thing that was the students talked about through some of our interviews was responsibility for failure. Is failure always my fault? Who gets the blame for failure if I talk about it? And grit became really popular about 10 years ago. And a few years after Angela Duckworth's book on grit came out, we saw a shift with respect to blame. Oh, you would have done better if you had more grit. You just need more grit to do better. And we see something similar happening with the rhetoric of resilience, where institutions downgrade responsibility for resilience to the individual. So we'll see across Canada, we had the student do a review of uh, resilience programming at institutions. And you see across Canada, these resilience programs that are geared towards the individual. Come to this webinar, become more resilient. Come to this X or Y, become more resilient. But we don't see the corresponding structural change with respect to policy and structural support for students. So we have to be careful of, of downloading responsibility for resilience onto the individual without also looking at structural factors. And something that came up quite often with our students was the power and privilege of failure. How do we communicate this to people? This is so nuanced. And this is work by Jennifer Ross, a former postdoc, as well as Pooja Day and Esther Baffer, the two students who are sh shown here. And I thought I would just walk you through this. So they worked on developing visualizations that communicate the power and privilege of failure. And I'll walk you through one of their visualizations here. So this blue core in the middle, this is the failure core. It's in everything we do. Failure is a part of this normal process, trying things that doesn't work, figure out why. Failure is core to their experience as students. And wrapping around failure are things that, that touch it really closely, that impact how you can respond to it. There's resources and support, there's institutional policy, there's huge subjectivity 
in what you experience and the status and the rank of the individual. These things all impact, can you learn from that failure? Can you bounce back? And these things are really closely tied to being a student in the institution. But then what about the broader sociocultural envelope that we live in? These puzzle pieces on the outside sort of make up the sociocultural envelope and they wanted to highlight the importance that discourses around failure, the language we use, inequality, stakes of failure, as well as stigma. So these are one of the visualizations they came up with. It's really hard to communicate their experience as students and power and privilege inherent in failure. And I'd like to share just a couple quotes here um, that students have shared about where their fear, fear of failure comes from. And this comes from um, some work some of our students as partners did. I think my fear of failure mostly comes from my parents and how they want me to succeed in school. If I receive a failing grade, I am more concerned about how they would feel about it rather than how I actually feel. Another student said, I believe my fear of failure comes from the fact I'm a first generation immigrant. My parents could not afford to go to school, so they did not. I feel like I don't belong in academia. Also, I do not want to retake a course as it's expensive and I cannot afford to. Another student stated, it's easy to preach about the importance of failure and list a few ways it has helped, but it doesn't change the fact that every little thing you do in school is graded and people are passed or failed, which can ruin someone's chance of getting into a program or school. This is what I think about when I think about failing something which greatly contributes to my fear. If we are telling students to take risks, try new courses, don't worry if you fail, but at the same time, their transcript is forever, that advice is a bit disingenuous. When we started this project, we interviewed quite a few students as well as faculty across disciplines. And the early findings showed that students and educators, educators have a really complex relationship with failure. Some really see the value, but some are very aware of potential negative impacts. Like this faculty member here highlights, I've been explicitly told my grades can't be too high. This faculty member says, I don't wanna be perceived as punitive in ways that can make the incorporation of failure into classes feel riskier to the well-being of my students. Very different views of failure. These quotes along with other resources are on um, this website that we're just launching. It's an open educational resource site that we would love to share with everyone. I'm gonna pop this link into the chat you can just pop in your email and then you will receive uh, a direct email when this website is live. It actually is live right now, um, but we're just uploading all the resources. The resources aren't quite, quite there yet. The website is learningfromfailure.ca. And if you enter your email onto that form, I'll send you an email when all the resources have been loaded. So the resources that are there, there are uh, failure reflective journals um, that students can do either embedded into courses or on their own, own time. They're discipline agnostic, so they don't have to be associated with a specific discipline. There's some syllabus guides related to policy and course design and framing. There are instructor and student wish lists, importantly, wish lists for what they wish administrators knew. There's some case studies. And there's uh, research data, and it, there's also this collaborative space where you can upload a new resource. We would love for other folks to be a part of this. On this resource hub, there's sections for students, instructors, and importantly, administrators. We really wanted administrators to be part of this conversation, especially relating to policy. And I just want to, again, go back and highlight how so many different folks contribute to this from different disciplines. And so on this site, it, it also highlights different folks that have been involved. And if you are interested in being involved further or you're interested in collaborating on future grant applications, um, you can add your photo and your profile here so that we can uh, keep collaborating and really try to affect the policy and the structural support side of things. So Neil, I'll pause there.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, we have 12 or 13 minutes left for some, uh, some questions, uh, some thoughts you'd like to share. If you are comfortable um, turning your camera or your mic on and speaking out loud, please raise your, your real or virtual hand. Or if you'd like to put some uh, questions in the chat, I will read them out. Uh, uh, and you can send them to me privately or publicly. Um, thank you so much. Nick has asked, I'm trying to place this work in a scholarly context. What theories are you using to guide these inquiries? Mm, that's such a good question. Thank you. So we're really trying to look at science of learning, theories around learning, but also science, uh, sorry, theories around social behavior and norms mm -hmm. and stigma. Um, we were looking a lot at paces of learning, uh, Bjork's work on desirable difficulties. So there is some evidence that shows if text is harder to read, you slow down and you actually have much better recall later mm. on. So we're looking at intersections with that related to science of learning. Um, Jennifer Ross, the postdoc who's, who's now a professor at Woodsworth uh, at the University of Toronto um, is really looking at the digital humanities side of things and the transition from, from high school to higher ed and um, theories that, that are involved there. Her PhD work actually comes from system collapse and Hurricane Katrina. And so she's really looking at the mm. system side of this and, and theories related to systems. Uh, Tricia has brought something great up in the chat I'm also dealing with right now, which is the, um, it's not exactly a question, but I wonder if you could speak to it, which is the idea of ethical failures, um, particularly about academic integrity violations. Um, is that something that you and your students have talked about or? Yes. So this is something that the students feel very strongly about. Um, mm -hmm. in terms of academic integrity and the policing of that and the language around that. There's been a shift um, to using Turnitin as a teaching tool rather than a punitive tool. So you use Turnitin earlier in the semester where students know how it works. They, they are able to detect where they're not paraphrasing very well and then they're able to improve it. So students in our interviews highlighted this incredible disconnect between instructors telling them to take risks, it's okay, learn from your mistakes. And yet when academic integrity violations are so punitive at that first outset, they don't get a chance to learn from their mistakes. And so students highlighted this disconnect really clearly. And it seems that different institutions take a very different approach to this in terms of the first, second, and third mistake. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it might be Geraldine or Geraldine. Uh, let's go ahead. Geraldine, actually. Hi. Oh, Geraldine. a failure. Damn it. <laughs> it's okay. I'm quite used to it. Um, just from, I think there might be another other couple people on the call here that are working at, at polytechnic institutions. And just the idea of the failure and uh, qualifications that industry requires of students, I've wondered if you've considered that. Right, so in, especially in terms of accreditation, we've talked about some programs that have accreditation and you need to meet a certain level. And so that comes back to this process versus this finite outcome. You might have something at the end that you have to achieve on, but learning through failure is integral to getting to that point where you can do that at the end. So that's how we frame it to the students. Yes, you have this final exam you wanna do really well on, you don't wanna necessarily fail that final exam, so it's really important you have lots of failures that come beforehand. And so that's usually how we frame it in our discussion with accreditation. So more using the formative feedback to get to the summative evaluation. Yeah, and the, the openness to understanding why you got that wrong answer. So we have some data about students that would open their midterm for feedback. How many students looked at the feedback? How many students looked at the wrong question? So before we gave things back online, we would have stacks of midterms in offices that just weren't picked up. Then now we can actually see who looks at their feedback. Why do they look at their feedback? Can we encourage students to look mm -hmm. at feedback? Maybe do those reflections uh, after midterms, for example. 
funny that you say that because I proposed a PD session for faculty next year on why learners don't look at feedback and how to solve those problems. Mm. We should definitely talk more on that. I think it's complex. And I think there's so much blame associated. Like you hear discussions in faculty spaces about, oh, the students don't care. They didn't pick up their midterm. I, I worked so hard on giving them feedback. And I think it's so important we look at, at why that's the case. Yeah. Um, uh, Shazia and Teresa have had a little dialogue, I think, in the chat, um, talking about that it might, you know, Shazia proposes that it might be a lot easier to get students to embrace failure than to create a structure at the sort of institutional level. And then Teresa shares how the higher ups at an institution were really opposed to narratives of failure in a workshop that they were planning. I wonder if you can talk about that you're in the hierarchy of, of academia. Yeah, that's something our students felt really strongly about is why should the onus only be on them mm. to share narratives of failure? Um, and one thing we experimented with is talking very openly about bias in narratives of failure and who gets judged for failing, who's allowed a second chance, et cetera, with students to try to look at that vulnerability of instructors sharing stories. Um, conversations with administrators are really tricky in terms of sharing university level failures, but we think that it's really important. And so can we carve out some spaces where the administration feels safe in sharing narratives of failure? Yeah. Um, Danielle has shared about um, some cross departmental discussions about resiliency and that their doubt about it, the possibility to really create a safe space for failure when grading still exists and, and that really matters. And I, you know, I, I just taught an intro to drama studies course and I had some science students who were like, I've never taken a humanities course. I've never been very good, but if I don't get an A minus, I can't afford to go to school next year. Um, and so I also am really challenged by this idea of how to structure a course where failure can be a part of it. Yeah, and, and so this idea of low stakes failure, because failure isn't necessarily an option when it comes to grades from the student's perspective. So the students will say, yes, all these narratives about failure, this is great, it's helping me learn, but I can't fail the exam. I can't fail on these high stakes assignments. So a lot of the work we're doing is around low stakes failure, where there is an embedded option for failure recovery. And so I think that's something that the students have really signposted as important is that with the final mm -hmm. exam, with the final transcript, there's no embedded option for failure recovery. Um, may I ask what that might look like, a, a system of failure recovery for students? Yeah, so the, the student union has been looking at grade retake policies. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when students come in in first year, they want to retake a course a year or a couple years later. And at many institutions, the first grade is the one that counts. They're not able to, to repeat that grade or replace that grade. And so they're looking at that from a policy perspective. Um, that could be an option for failure recovery, but it doesn't deal with the associated financial burden of retaking a course. Right. Um, uh, another thing could be related to um, student selection of grading schemes, student selection of emphasis of grades on different things that has been shown to decrease their hesitancy to take risks. So that's another one. Um, but we have to look at it from a, a policy perspective. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm just there's seeing, a, um, this comment, if I could flag one, if you don't mind, please. one person shared, I allow my students to resubmit if they quote fail an assignment. They can only receive a B plus at most as they benefit from feedback and other students do not, et cetera. Mm. So you have this option for resubmission, resubmission assignments. I think that can be really important. Um, one thing with that is that we have to build in structural supports for marking time and, and TA time. So maybe students get to resubmit one or two assignments from term. We're trying to take a look at that with respect to labs right now. And what does that look in terms of TA support for large classes? I like that. Hmm. Uh, Nick has shared uh, about, you know, that there's a question of what definitional issue, what does failure mean? 
I think it's important to recognize that there are material dimensions and consequences, but also subjective and experiential. In my view, many of the phenomena we are talking about on the right end of your continuum uh, are not experienced as failure for a variety of reasons. For my part, failure is first and foremost an experience. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe failure is not the word we should be using. And this comes up all the time. Like, like, and you'll see in the literature, especially about math, this word productive failure. And so, so failing in math and, and helping you to learn math better. Really, aren't we just talking about the normal struggle of learning? Isn't this just mm. productive struggle? So, so maybe failure isn't even the word we should be using. It's a word that, that most people are able to identify this idea of learning from failure, but I, I completely agree that maybe we need a different language when we're referring to this. Yeah, Fraser suggests teachable moment. Um, I also think too that if you, ex if you experience it as a failure, then it is a failure in your to you, you know, and so what our students experience as failures, and I wonder if there's a way we can help students to, I guess is what you're proposing, helping students to reframe those moments in their own yeah. imagining. I see um, a comment here from Jessica, just curious if similar high stakes environments have been explored in the FLIP research so far. So we haven't done high stakes failure, partly um, that's because a lot of this work was student as partners driven. And the students were really clear of the need to start with low stakes failure, where there's an option for failure recovery. And so thinking about ethics and, and framing of that, that's something that we're still really struggling with is how do we do some of this work in a high stakes environment? If, if we do, we need to have a failure recovery option. Hmm. Um, this is terrific. Um, I feel like this is conversation is really flying and we could go on forever, but we have, we have come to the end of our hour and I'm really grateful to you, um, Fiona for sharing with us, for being part of such a terrific conversation. I'm grateful for everyone taking part in the chat and for everyone speaking out loud.